In the 1860s, young Virginians went off to war for a variety of reasons. Patriotism and a sense of honor were prevailing factors in that age of high emotion. The novelty of warfare, inspiration from speakers, and newspaper notices played a role. An opportunity to make new friends, see new sights, and gain glory for oneself were strong attractions. Sometimes, just a flag waving majestically in the blue sky was enough to point a man toward the army. And not joining the army ran the risk of being called a coward. Northerners enlisted to preserve the Union, while Southern boys volunteered to preserve their unique way of life in the South and to establish their own country. Strangely, both sides believed they were fighting for democracy and freedom. And why not? Both sides spoke the same language, worshiped the same God, had the same likes and dislikes, and shared the exact same national background. The average Virginia soldier was a farm boy, though there were lots of laborers and clerks and students in the Army as well. He stood five feet eight inches tall and weighed 135 pounds. He was native born, Protestant, and single. He had come into the Army not to fight for the Confederacy, but to defend Virginia his native country. Companies of 100 men were formed locally in a city or county. This encouraged relatives, friends, and neighbors to serve together. State governments organized 10 companies into regiments of 1,000 men each. The regiments were also grouped according to regions. All 10 companies of the 1st Virginia Infantry Regiment were from Richmond. The 4th Virginia, organized in southwestern Virginia, contained four companies from Montgomery County. The issue of black military service had been debated. Probably the most famous episode was when Patrick Claiborne sent a letter to his commanding officer recommending that the Confederacy begin recruiting African Americans. He thought this was an excellent solution to the manpower crisis in the Confederate Army. By 1860, late 1864, 1865, the issue of black military service hit a critical point, and the Confederacy began discussing in a serious way enlisting blacks, but it really took the intervention of Robert E. Lee, who spoke out once and then sent a letter to a congressman supporting the notion of black military service in the Confederacy to get it passed by the Confederate Congress. And in that instance, in one of the houses, it passed by only one vote. So they only raised a couple of hundred bl black soldiers when the war ended, and they didn't participate in any meaningful way. The Confederacy had about one million white men who served and in order to win the war, the Confederacy was going to have to depend on black laborers to fill the void. Confederates used black laborers for fortifications construction. They used them as teamsters, as laborers on bridges and on railroads. In virtually all capacities that the Confederacy required labor, they employed African Americans. Early in the Civil War, the soldiers adopted nicknames for each other. Since colonial times, people who lived in the North were known as Yankees, and so it was natural that Northern soldiers were called Yanks. Many people in the North thought the Confederates were waging a rebellion, and so they referred to Confederate soldiers as Rebs. For no particular reason over time, Confederate soldiers became known as Johnny Rebs, and Union soldiers as Billy Yanks. Most of the young men who volunteered to be soldiers in the Civil War thought their experience as soldiers would be a short one. Perhaps a couple of weeks of brief campaigning, a battle or two, and then a triumphant return home. But as time went on, the soldiers understood that their principal enemies were mud and dust, heat and cold, sickness and hunger, and ever-present loneliness. Some 75% of enlistees were infantry, 20% joined the cavalry, and 5% served in the artillery. Army life brought a host of new experiences. The first shock came when farmers and students entered an army camp with thousands of strangers. There, the soldiers had to absorb the novelty of discipline, practice the art of drilling, learn how to handle equipment, dig earthworks, 
make a campfire, and cook unfamiliar food. A typical day in camp began at 5 in the morning and lasted until 9 at night. The soldier's two main meals were breakfast and supper, and most of his day was spent in learning to drill. Some of the officers were as inexperienced as the men they were training. Order arms. One man said it is funny for a fellow to try to teach another man what he don't know himself. For many of the soldiers, learning to fire the military musket of the day was a very difficult process. New recruits would learn to load and fire the rifle musket using nine commands. The first command would be called, load it nine times, load. The second command would be called handle cartridge, bringing up a paper tube containing 70 grains of black powder and a 58 caliber lead mini ball. The next command would be tear cartridge. Next command would be charge cartridge. Now the powder would spill to the bottom, but the soldier would take his thumb to squeeze that bullet in at the top. In order to force it all the way down though, a metal ramrod would be used. Draw rammer. Ram cartridge, ramming the projectile to the bottom. Return rammer. The next command will be called, for safety, I will point this direction, the next command will be called Prime. At that command, the right foot will go behind the left foot, making a T, swing the musket to the side, go back one click to half cock, reach over onto the belt, and take out one percussion cap. A brass top hat looking thing with a uh, fulminate of mercury inside, which is a contact explosive. The cap will be placed upon their firing cone. The recruit would then back to, go back to shoulder arms, informing their officer that they're loaded. In order to fire, there will be three more firing commands called Ready, Full cock, aim, fire. The average Civil War soldier was a pretty bad marksman with his rifle. They did very little target practice, and when they got into battle, they tended to aim too high, with the battle smoke making visibility almost zero. On the march, a Civil War army was expected to advance 10 to 30 miles a day. The average marching speed was two and a half miles per hour. That was a good pace indeed. Because the armies crisscrossed back and forth across Virginia, the tendency was that an army might encamp on the same place where another army had been. And there they found bare earth, void of vegetation, and full of piles of smelly garbage. And yet even when an army picked a new encampment, it did not take long to contaminate the land. As an example, an army of 100,000 men would have 30,000 horses. Each horse is going to drop 12 pounds of manure a day. That comes out to 360,000 pounds of manure per day when the army encamped. And we're only talking about what the horses left. Rain turned the ground into a colored swamp. A Virginia soldier stationed near Manassas wrote home that his regiment was posted in a lake of mud so soft you had to hold your breath to keep from sinking. For most Virginia Confederates, joining the Army was the first time they had ever been away from home. Did not take long for the early excitement of Army life to vanish. In its place came homesickness intensified by a lack of communication. A member of the 10th Virginia moaned, shut out from the rest of the world, we have nothing to think of but the loved ones at home. No television, computer, radio, or telephone existed in the 1860s. Newspapers and magazines were scarce. The only way for a soldier to communicate with his family or sweetheart at home was by writing a letter. More written correspondence occurred during the American Civil War than at any other time in our history. Handwriting was usually crude and men often spelled the words the way they pronounced them. Still, there was nothing more precious to a soldier's eyes than receiving a letter from home. Next to letter writing, music was the most uh, popular diversion for soldiers north and south. In Virginia, songs such as uh, uh, The Bonnie Blue Flag and Dixie and When Johnny Comes Marching Home are perennial favorites, whether they were on the march or in the campgrounds. In fact, the war would generate over 2,000 new songs, new songs to stimulate nation building north and south, songs to get soldiers out of the parlors and into the regiments and into the fields of march. Songs that can be used, however, to remind one of the home that you've left, Home Sweet Home being one of the favorites north and south. 
It's around the campfire that the soldiers so often would remind themselves of home, thinking about the loved ones that they had left, the horrors that they were fighting for. Yet the folks back home tended to be attracted to the songs praising the glorious boys in their wonderful uh, gilt-buttoned uniforms as they marched away proudly in the regiments. A soldier usually spent 49 of every 50 days in camp. The Johnny Reb from Virginia, just like the Billy Yank from Pennsylvania, was a civilian on loan to the military. Independent-minded, he complained about every aspect of Army life. In most instances, his criticisms were justified. Officers were a popular target, so were long marches. Constant drilling seemed to them to be a waste of time. Virginia soldiers complained the most about food as well they should. When in camp, they received food on a fairly regular basis, but on a march or in a battle campaign, they often had to go hungry. And thus, over and over, the Confederate soldier had to make a decision, whether to endure the pain of an empty stomach or the upset stomach that came from eating tainted meat, which they called salty dog, and moldy bread, which they termed worm castles. The soldiers during the Civil War were not used to the food they had to live on. They also weren't used to the many other problems that Army life brings. Now, these were young men that uh, prior to the Civil War, many were farmhands, many had been shopkeepers, many had been laborers in many respects, and they had not been exposed to a lot of um, diseases that now thrust into communal settings where there were many men in a small area, they all of a sudden became exposed to diseases that we would consider today childhood diseases, measles, rubella, uh, whooping cough, diphtheria, any disease that can be contagious or can be infectious, viruses, bacteria, they could readily trans transmit those from one man to the other. Many of the soldiers here in the Confederate section of the Old City Cemetery in Lynchburg, Virginia, died for lack of clean potable water. They had contaminated creeks, they had foods that were ill-prepared, they could not clean their, cleanse their wounds properly. That led to much of the illness, much of the despair, much of the destruction, and much of the death during the Civil War. When 50,000 to 100,000 individuals came together as an army, they lived in conditions that made them sick. Private William Morgan wrote home that he had rather face the Yankees than the sickness, and there's always more men dies of sickness than in battle. Yeah, that, sir, that soldier was correct. Uh, being in the Army was a very dangerous um, profession or activity, if you will, in the, in the early 1860s. There were over three million men that fought during the Civil War, and 618,000 of them gave their lives. About two-thirds of those men lost their lives due to illnesses and due to diseases. They were not uh, war-inflicted wounds that caused them to, to lose their lives. Of the one-third that did lose their lives from battlefield injuries, 94% of those lost them from gunshot wounds. We talk about edged weapons, swords and bayonets and sabers. Those were actually more for show, I think, as a practical matter. They really weren't the great killers during the Civil War. The Civil War brought improvements to the way the wounded were cared for in the short term and in the long term. The Civil War uh, really brought of age the Ambulance Corps and the ability to rapidly transport men away from an active conflict and to these field hospitals and to subsequently to the general hospitals. After First Manassas, First Bull Run, the largest hospital in Washington, D.C. held 40 patients. By the end of the war, there were hospitals dotted all up and down the eastern United States, both northern and south, that contained hundreds of soldiers at any given time. The hospital system really was, was, came of age during the Civil War. Surviving the hardships that the soldiers on both sides faced took more than just courage. The thing that most enabled Virginia soldiers to endure all the hardships of war was religion. In worshiping God, there was hope and safety. Hundreds of recruits went off to war carrying little Bibles with them. Men would gather in large numbers whenever a chaplain or missionary appeared for a field service. 
quite aware that the North had superior numbers, the Confederates came to believe that God had to be on their side if there was to be success. As Captain Thomas McDowell of Virginia wrote his wife, we must rely upon our own armies, but must trust implicitly in the saving mercy of God. Faith, therefore, was a weapon for survival, just as worshiping God was a connecting link between the soldiers in the field and the folks back home. Of course, the great test for these young Virginians would be how would they stand in the day of battle. Certainly, they feared death, but perhaps even more, they feared that when the moment came, they might lose their courage and turn and run, for if they did so, it would be in full view of the young men they had grown up with, their friends and their comrades, and word would inevitably get home. Wounds certainly could occur, and they weren't so fearful of wounds. A nice decorative scar to take home after the war would even be a sign of their great service, what the writer Stephen Crane would later call a red badge of courage. The degree of their sacrifices is sometimes unbelievable. While sickness constantly stripped the ranks, battle casualties often brought a regiment to the point of near extinction. The 33rd Virginia returned from Gettysburg with a captain and three privates. In every battle there was human leakage, men who would fall back because while they could stand some things, they could not stand everything. And yet for each man who faltered, a hundred or more rose to heights of heroism. Infantry were known to charge against concentrated musketry, leaning forward as if they were advancing into a rainstorm rather than into a storm of lead. Wounded men would not go to the rear, but would continue fighting in spite of their injuries. If an officer fell, the private would jump forward and take command without being ordered to do so. And when the color barrel fell, a dozen or more men would leap forward to seize the colors, knowing full well that the enemy shot the color barrel first in order to bring down the flag and spirit with it. We are at Hollywood Cemetery in downtown Richmond. Behind me is one of the largest monuments to Confederate soldiers. More than 700,000 men died in that war. In proportion to modern population, the death toll would be six million. Those who survived the war soon began to realize that they had been part of the greatest event of the 19th century. And as these veterans grew older, they began to bond together in a mutual sense of accomplishment as they commemorated what had been and what they now were. Johnny Rebs never apologized for what they had done. Billy Yanks never asked them to do so. And so with this common legacy which they forged, they left a gift to us, to all Americans, for all time to come.